Hello everyone and welcome back to another video and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be taking a look at this very interesting unit from Hotel Chi from around 1983. Model number VT680ME. This is a portable VHS video recorder with a built-in 4-inch colour screen. And it actually uses a CRT screen which makes it even more interesting. This can be run either from 240 volts or 12 volts or from an internal battery. This unit actually has a full-size VHS tape deck built in. Um, shortly after this came out, VHSC tapes came along, which made the units a lot smaller. Unfortunately, my example here, which is in poor shape, is actually faulty. It will play a tape, but unfortunately the take-up spool isn't going around, so it stops. And also, fast forward and rewind are a little intermittent. Sometimes they'll work, sometimes they won't. Featuring four logic control, the mechanism really sounds quite nice. If you press play and press pause quick enough, it will actually pause and show off a still image. It seems to hunt about a little bit, but it will get there eventually. It just won't play back continuously. There was also another model available at the time, the VT6500, but this was a VHS player recorder only. So let's take a look around the machine at its connectivity and its features. With its built-in 4-inch colour CRT screen, this would have been an absolute game changer back in the day. Because when you were outside filming back then, all you could rely on was a black and white viewfinder and the camera itself to watch your footage back and to see if it was in focus. To the far right of the machine, you have the eject button, tape counter, memory, battery indicator and a switch for sound, sound off and date in. And the buttons across the top front panel for operating the machine, operate, audio dub, record, rewind, play, fast forward, stop, pause and insert. And on the far right side of the machine you have a mic and earphone socket, audio in and out, video in and out, camera remote on or off, colour selector switch for auto, colour 1 or colour 2, date in, select advance and a TV connection. I don't recognise that TV connection. And then you have your 10 pin camera socket which was the standard back in the day and a 12 volt input. And on the back of the unit you have your RF modulator, test signal. And under this little flap, tuner adapter, remote and RF out. My example here came with a mains adapter which plugs into the 12 volt DC input where you can also remove this and plug in your battery instead. And on the left of the machine we have an AC input of 220 volts which actually isn't working. Vertical hold, colour, brightness, camera off, monitor off and auto. I should imagine this unit would have been used by salesmen a lot back in the day, taking out their demonstration tapes. There were many different cameras available at the time, ranging from all sorts of prices, even black and white cameras. So you had quite a choice of uh, what type of camera you wanted to plug into this machine. Depending on your budget of course, but then back then in this time period, a lot of people rented this equipment, because it was far too expensive for the average person to purchase. Here for this demonstration I'm using a Hitachi VKC840. So in the remainder of this video I'm going to be taking this machine apart and have a look inside and see if I can get it going again. So fingers crossed we'll get it working and we'll see what happens. Okay so let's just briefly have a look at the fault again. Um, when I press play the um, take up spool doesn't go around. You can see that the um, left spool does go around. <laughs> I can hear the machine lacing up, and then after a short moment, uh, it stops. The wind and fast forward seems to be working okay at this point. It just seems to be the take up spool. So I'm hoping, like I said before, it's just about. So next we'll uh, get it open and uh, have a look inside. Um, first thing to take off on this machine, as with pretty much all of them, is the lid on the cassette compartment. Before we continue, we're just going to remove that uh, external power supply. DC jack on this was quite tight actually. And there's the remains of a spider uh, just at the entrance point. A little 12 volt power supply which will be handy for other devices actually. Unfortunately there is some damage on the flex there as you can see as it enters the casing of the power supply. I'll have to address that at a later date. 
at this point I didn't have a service manual uh, but later on I do find a service manual for the VT6500 which is essentially just the same machine uh, but without the colour screen on the side. Looks quite clean inside, just a little bit of uh, dirty head drum. I'm going to start off by removing the uh, top cabinet screws. Never been in one of these before so it's a bit of a learning curve. After a little bit of jostling, I managed to get the cabinet top off. And there's a little speaker wire there connected to the CRT board. Just a pull out plug. Just looking for some date stamp marks. I couldn't see any on the cabinet on this machine. But looking at the service manual for the VT6500, I think it was dated 1981-82 time. Interesting affair at the back here. I've never seen this type of loading mechanism before. Uh, there was a little notice there as well saying not to remove the band um, without turning the wheels, or, or not to turn the wheels, otherwise you'll knock it all out of sync. Nice little colour CRT there on the left. If anything, this machine's worth it for just that, because that's actually working. Let's get that bottom handle off and have a look underneath, see what's in here. I decided to remove the front handle at this point because it was getting in the way and uh, further down the line I think I'm going to need to take it off anyway. On the back of the machine there's a small tab that you need to uh, pop out to get the bottom of the case off. And there we go, finally we're in. And again no date stamps on this bottom panel either, which quite surprised me actually. Decided to remove the cassette loading mechanism to see, uh, have a better look underneath. Just two screws for this, one on the left and one on the right, near the uh, tape end sensors. And I've just noticed that uh, there appears to be a belt missing uh, from the capstan drive there, the brass capstan drive, to that plastic wheel there. Looks to me like there should be a belt on that to help drive the take-up spool, which is probably why it's not working. So next up, it's time to have a look through my belt stash to see if I've got anything that will suit for now just to see if we can get it running. After my first failed attempt to put the loading mechanism back in, I realised there's a small switch or mechanical contact point on the loading bar across the bottom at the front of the machine there. If you don't quite get that loaded up right, the eject won't work. But uh, even after putting that belt on, as you can see here, the take-up spool went round for a moment and then stopped. And then of course it delays itself. Just coming up the sensors there to uh, trick it into thinking there's a tape in the machine. Just having a closer look at the idler wheel here. There's a small idler wheel underneath that uh, white reel there uh, with a small rubber on it. If it's gone shiny or cracked, it won't be quite making enough uh, contact or friction on the takeout spool. So I think the next thing to do is to get that open and have a look inside. Uh, after removing some uh, plastic washers on the takeout spool, I removed it to have a look. Just having a quick look there at the take-up spool, um, it still feels quite rough, so it's got a good surface to uh, for the idler to go up against. Next up, I'm starting to trick the machine into play. I've got some tape there over the LED sensor in the middle, and there's a little tab down the bottom left which you can't see just off camera that I've had to press to trick it into play just to see what the idler does. And as you can see, it started going around the right there and then it stopped. 
So there definitely seems to be an issue on that side of things. It's a very smooth mechanic operation on this machine. It runs very quietly compared to others. There just doesn't seem to be enough resistance there to drive the take-up spool, let alone pour cassette tape around, even with the help of the capstan motor. So the idle rod rubs up against this part here, uh, which again looks in uh, good shape. There's a small wash underneath there, being held on by grease. And there's still some resistance there, still some uh, thread, some grooves for the idle rod to rub against. I managed to get hold of some of these idle rods recently, but unfortunately uh, none of them are the size I need, unfortunately. So um, next thing I'm going to try and do is uh, turn the idle wheel rubber inside out on itself. Uh, but unfortunately doing this, um, I soon found out that wasn't going to be possible due to the size of the idle rubber, it was too small to let itself be turned inside out. Um, but uh, looking at it, it didn't look too bad, it looked a little bit shiny. Um, so I ended up just uh, reassembling the unit and then retesting. And uh, funnily enough, it was now working, uh, the take up spool was going around. But not for long, um, it was stopping again. And I've also noticed that fast forward and rewind are now not continuing, they seem to be stopping after a few moments. But uh, the take up spool is going round, so I've got a little bit further. I think handling that idler rubber, uh, trying to turn it inside out for five or ten minutes, and with greasy fingers seem to have revived it slightly, but for how long we'll see. So now we have a new problem to look at. I think it was time to have a look underneath the machine now um, to see what's going on under there, if anything. Although I don't expect to see much because um, the loading mechanism seems to be at the back of this machine, whereas on other models in this time period they all tend to be underneath and belt driven. Um, it actually took me uh, quite a while to figure out how to get into the bottom of this machine, usually just a case of undoing a couple of screws and the uh, PCB uh, on the bottom there just folds out. But uh, in this instance you had to remove the front panel unclip the servo control board at the front and there's a, I think there's a screw at the back and then the whole thing lifts backwards on itself and you just need to undo the counter um, reset uh, cable, the memory uh, cable so the board will uh, fold away. And I was right, there wasn't much to look at at all. Uh, that big white thing there is the capstan motor uh, cover um, which is underneath of there. And at the bottom there you've got that motor there which does the idlers and then the head drum. Uh, one thing I did notice actually, there's a small fuse on the 12 volt input on the side there, because uh, this has two 12 volt input modes, ports, one's on the back and one's on the side. And the fuse are blown on this one, uh, just a four amp fuse. So I suspect somebody's probably tried to put voltage in it either the wrong way, or um, some kind of power surge has happened. I can see uh, a mode selector switch there, which could be a suspect. It's got dirty contacts, so I popped that off in a moment, gave it a clean, but uh, it didn't seem to make any difference. At one point, uh, the machine started rewinding fast forwarding for a bit longer. Um, I started using the DC input on the side there since I replaced that fuse. I thought that might have been a difference, but it stopped again. One thing I did notice on the bottom of the main board there, on the servo board, I think it is, is um, some messy soldering and a little bit of a damaged PCB. But uh, upon further inspection and testing continuity with the multimeter, it seemed to be all in order. On the back of the board, it uh, belongs to these little orange packages. I'm not quite sure what they are, but there was three of them together. Even though the band on the back there for the loading mechanism seemed okay, it seemed quite tight, I thought I'll swap it out um, off camera just to see if it makes any difference. I marked both the wheels there um, so I know which orientation they would go back round. It's important to keep these um, correct for the timing of the loading mechanism I assume. And it still made no difference. So I ended up uh, swapping the old band back in here and I thought I'd record this in case anybody wonders how to get it out. 
and the band I put in was a little bit too thin anyway. So I ended up swapping the original band back in place. One thing I have noticed is the machine will go into pause. Uh, interesting to know that the pause lamp indicator is not working and it does take a while to go into pause. It seems to hunt about until it gets its best still image. Uh, you can keep on doing this and it will stay in the play mode whilst paused. Unfortunately though still fast forward and rewind and play are still stopping after a few moments. So there you have it, I've gone as far as I can go at the moment. Uh, there's nothing in the service manual about this uh, problem. The service manual just covers disassembly and obviously testing things uh, with some scope readings. Um, if anybody has any suggestions or ideas of what I could try next, please let me know in the comments. And then uh, maybe I can do a part two to this. Uh, there doesn't seem to be many videos out there on this machine. In fact, the only one I've seen with any repairs um, is a forehead machine somebody in the Far East that's done the video about. It was like quite a nice machine actually. Well I guess that just about brings me to the end of this video. Unfortunately we didn't get this going this time. Uh, but like I said, maybe with the help of the community we can uh, take this a bit further and do a part two. I guess that just leaves me to say as always thanks for watching and until the next video I'll be seeing you. And if you did enjoy watching this video you may want to take a look at some of my other videos on similar themes. I'm always buying something on eBay, some old piece of technology and trying to repair it. And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Thanks for watching.